CIE, of course, the Import Expo is celebrating the fifth uh, anniversary, and Rio Tinto is especially featured uh, this year. Uh, I heard also for the very first time such a scale participation. Uh, what is your input about, you know, through this kind of channel to let the Chinese customers know Rio Tinto better, while at the same time to demonstrate your confidence in both the Chinese market and also in cooperation? First of all, uh, in order to have trade, you need to build relationships. So these events are massively important. And it's uh, thank you for the organizers. It's great this has been organized. Secondly, the world of addressing climate change is really complex. No one has the perfect answers. And that even further uh, requires that we work together. And every time I speak with our customers in China, they talk about how they want to decarbonize uh, their business. And uh, it's, it's a little bit like we have a little bit of the solution and someone else has another part of the solution, someone else has another part. And it's only when you bring that together that you can find the best solutions for the long term. Mm -hmm. so, so I would argue when you are faced with something like addressing climate change, you need even more to bring people together in order to find to find solutions. Mm. On climate change, I do want to tap more into what you have done. Uh, you are committing Rio Tinto from now until 2030, 7.5 billion US dollars. Meanwhile, you are pledging to reduce the CO2 50% until the year 2030. That is a big goal for a company, the type like yours, that is a big challenge. How do you see this process of implementing that goal? Yeah, no, look, um, we do this not just because it's the right thing, but really we think it's, it's, it's good business. Uh, we um, laid out when I took over a year and a half as CEO four objectives uh, for the company to become the best operator, to have impeccable ESG credentials, to excel in development, think long term and build the future portfolio and to have a strong social license. At the heart of that, we realize that climate change both represents a challenge and an opportunity. But it's not credible for us to grab that opportunity unless we clean up our own house. And that was why we said our own emissions have to have that by 2030. That's what we call impeccable ESG credentials. It's going to be super challenging and we will spend a lot of money. I still believe it's going to be good, good investment because it's kind of future proofing our business. There are issues that you have to deal with during the implementation. What are the biggest challenges right now you are thinking about and looking at during this process? The, the, the key thing is to actually figure out how to spend the money well, because there are certain things, yeah, but you've got the money, 7.5 billion, how to spend uh, it. Everybody say spend here, spend there. Well, but, but the reality is like certain things are pretty crystal clear is like you need electricity, try to get more renewable energy, but you also got a lot of processing plants and how do you reconfigure them? And should it be hydrogen that you should use as the energy source? There are many technical solutions and that's, that's why it's, well, it's both exciting, but it's also challenging to figure out from a simply research and development point of view, which is the easiest and the cheapest way to achieve the target of reducing CO2. Mm. I was reading some of your interviews earlier with other media organizations. You dismissed earlier the possibility of the so-called the greenflation, uh, mainly uh, the cost of the raw materials might be higher and also offering the price of your products to your consumers might be higher. Now, uh, giving more complexity, of course, there's the energy issue and the geopolitics uh, with the result of uh, might be disruption of uh, global supply chains and value chains. No. So, uh, Jake, what about that question? Yeah, look, um, I think the world can afford to decarbonize as long as it looks long term and say, you know, China has got very clear targets of, of reaching carbon zero by 2060. There's still some time to go. So we don't need to panic, but we need to make meaningful steps in the right direction. And yes, it's going to be a little bit more expensive to use steel and to produce aluminium 
in a carbon neutral way, but there's actually pathways to it. And I would argue that, that we can afford that. Whereas it might have an impact on the commodity price, the impact on the consumer goods is actually very, very small. Many calculations indicates that the cost of, a, for example, a new car will only be three to 5% more if it was carbon neutral. And think about the following proposition here. If you have an electrical, if people go out and buy an electrical vehicle, part of the reason for buying that is, of course, that you're thinking about the climate. But it actually takes typically six years of going on green electricity uh, rather than using com a combustion engine fuel uh, before you have saved the CO2 that goes into producing the car. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to produce that car where it doesn't take six years, but perhaps three years or two years or one year before you kind of have earned the production of the car. That's the business we are in, really trying to reduce the CO2 content in the materials that goes into all sorts of consumer goods. With the ever complex the world, do you see a competition and some kinds of uncertainties about that. What is the opportunities and the challenges in that regard for a company like yours? First of all, some of the critical materials is not so much about where you mine it, it's more about processing capabilities. China is by far the world leader in, in processing. We have some processing plants primarily in North America where we're also extracting uh, some critical uh, minerals. But the reality is there's plenty of critical minerals in, in the earth. It's more about the capability to extract it in the processing, having both the technical com competences and the processing uh, 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 facilities. Uh, China is, is clearly leading and uh, there's, there's a growth opportunity here. We are doing quite a lot in, uh, in, in, in North America. But I think that's only the one thing. Uh, the other dimension that we just talked about is the CO2 content on these mm. materials. So for example, we have a very big aluminium industry that is based on hydropower. That, of course, reduces the CO2 content of the aluminium. I think there will be much, much more of that. And I'm quite amazed to see how much renewable energy that's being developed in China as well. So, Jacob, what is your assessment of the developing world for a company like yours? I think it provides a lot of opportunities. And I think more developed economy has a responsibility to try to help developing countries uh, develop. And uh, so, for example, right now, what I've spent a lot of my time on this year is, is working, by the way, with three uh, major Chinese uh, uh, shareholders and Chinese contractors on developing what could be one of the world's largest mining projects in Guinea called Simandu. It's a unique opportunity for actually bringing wealth to people in the country. It's a real country maker, mm -hmm. fascinating. And on top of that, the world needs this very pure iron ore, which is actually leading to less CO2 reduction. So you both address climate change and you can help developing an, in, an economy in Africa. We can't do things on our own. We have to do it in partnership and we have to think intelligently about, about partnership. Talking about the partnership, how do you look at China's uh and Chinese businesses, uh, global roles. We have carefully studied uh, China's uh, policies externally as well. And I think that's exactly what we are living right now, where we are doing joint ventures with uh, Chinese partners outside China as well. So the DII initiative from President Xi is what is, what is actually happening in action. Mm. It reminds me, Jacob, your answer of uh, several interviews I did earlier with the early pioneers of China's reform and opening up, that people are feeling the temperature every day, try to get the real essence of it, and try to figure out how it would work uh, so that everybody has their responsibility, but also has their advantage uh, uh, being explored. So is this a new time, a new era in a way, Jacob, uh, from your perspective of exploring and feeling the temperatures, figure out the best way, because the world is changing so much. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> obviously, when you, have, when you have global tensions, you, 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 I'm not a politician, I, I'm, I'm a businessman, but the reality is mining 
there are demands for, for mine products and those are in certain markets and where you have the, the ore bodies is in other markets and that's, that's why mining per definition is global mm -hmm. and it's really in everybody's interest that you're trying to extract the best ore bodies and move it towards where the market is. For me, m mining is one of the best examples of that there's so much win-win in global trade. And we just have to figure out to do things in a, in a meaningful way so it becomes a win for everyone, for the country where the mining activity is. It has to be for the benefit of the local communities and the, the, the country at large. And of mm. course, uh, what is important for a country like China with a massive manufacturing industry is to have supply security. And that's why it makes imminent sense that some of our customers are partners in, in the joint ventures that, that we have.